I will arise and go to my father and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I'm no more worthy to be called your son. Dearly beloved brethren, this scripture moveth us in sundry places to acknowledge and confess our manifold sins and wickedness, and that we should not dissemble nor cloak them before the face of Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, but confess them with an humble, lowly, penitent and obedient heart to the end that we may obtain forgiveness of the same by his infinite goodness and mercy although we ought at all times humbly to acknowledge our sins before God yet are we chiefly so to do when we meet together to render thanks for the great benefits that we've received in his hands to set forth his most worthy praise to hear his most holy word and to ask those things that are requisite and necessary for the body as well as the soul. Wherefore, I pray and beseech you, as many as are here present, to accompany me with a pure heart and humble voice unto the throne of the heavenly grace, saying, Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from thy ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against thy holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done. And we've done those things which we ought not to have done. And there is no health in us. Spare thou those, O God, who confess their faults. Restore thou those who are penitent, broken, humbled, in the dust who kneel according to thy promises declared unto mankind in Christ Jesus our Lord and grant O most merciful father for his sake that we may hereafter live a godly righteous and sober life a humble life to the glory of thy great name Amen <clears throat> the almighty and everlasting God Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who desires not the death of a sinner, but rather that he turn from his wickedness and live, has declared in his almighty word that he pardons and absolves those who repent and are humble before him, and who embrace his forgiveness, are open and receive it. Wherefore, let us beseech him ever to grant us repentance and that faith, that the things that we are doing at this pleasant present may be pleasing in his sight hereafter, until at length he call us to his eternal home. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever, amen. O Lord, open thou our lips and our mouth shall show forth thy praise. O God, make speed to save us. O Lord, make haste to help us. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Praise ye the Lord. In the Lord's name be praised. Psalter election is Psalm 11, verses 4 and 5. Jehovah is in the palace of his holiness. Jehovah is in heaven where he hath his throne. His eyelids, his eyes behold the children of men. Just a second here. And what follows the psalm's glories in the assurance of God's favor, of which I have spoken, being destitute of human aid, 
he betakes himself to the providence of God. It is a signal pr proof of faith, as I have observed elsewhere, to take and to borrow, so to speak. Light from heaven to guide us to the hope of salvation. When we are surrounded in this world with the darkness on every side, all men acknowledge that the world is governed by the providence of God. But when there comes some sad confusion of things which disturbs their ease and involves them in difficulty, there are few who retain in their minds this firm persuasion of this truth. But from the example of David, we ought to make such account of the providence of God as to hope for a remedy from his judgment, even when matters are the most desperate. There is, in the words, an implied contrast between heaven and earth. For if, for if David's attention had been fixed on the state of things in the world, as they appeared to the eye of sense and reason, he would have no prospect of deliverance from his present perilous circumstances. But this was not David's exercise. On the contrary, when in the world all justice lies trodden underfoot and faithfulness has perished, he reflects that God sits perfect in heaven and unchanged, from whom it became him to look over the restoration of order from this state of miserable confusion. He does not simply say that God dwells in heaven, but that he reigns in heaven there as his royal palace and has his throne of judgment there. Nor do we render to him the honor which is his due unless we're fully persuaded that his judgment seat is a sanct sacred sanctuary for all who are in affliction and unrighteously oppressed. When therefore deceit, craft, treachery, cruelty, violence, extortion reign in the world order, when all things are thrown into disorder and darkness by injustice and wickedness, let faith serve as a lamp to enable us to behold God's heavenly throne and let that sight sufficient, suffice us to wait in patience for the restoration of things to a better estate. The temple of his holiness or his holy temple, which is commonly taken for Zion, doubtless here signifies heaven and that it does so clearly shown by the repetition in the next clause. Jehovah has his throne in heaven for it is certain that David expresses the same thing twice. And now we turn to Joshua. Give me just a second here. I want to get something over on the other side of the screen. We're talking about uh, Joshua turning to the northern kingdoms. Uh, he's already finished. And it was it a year operation, a one year, two year operation? It's not clear. So we are in verses 1 to 15 of chapter 11, the war in northern Canaan, verses 1 to 3. Upon receiving intelligence of what occurred in the south, the king of Hazor, that would be up north, formed an alliance with the kings of Madan. Shimram and Akshbik and the other kings of the north to make a common attack upon the Israelites. The league originated with Jacob, Jabob, Jabin, I'm sorry, of Hazor, because Hazor was formerly the head of all the kingdoms of northern Canaan. Hazor, which Joshua conquered and burned to the ground in verses 10 and 11, was at later restored and became once again the capital, as we see in the book of Judges. 
It was fortified later, centuries later, by Solomon, and also taken by the Assyrian king Tiglath-Pileser. It belonged to the tribe of Naphtali, but had, has not yet been discovered. According to Josephus, in the late first century, it was above the lake of Samokanitis, the present bar El Hula, wonderful town up in there, north of the Sea of Galilee. Robinson conjectures that it is to be found in the ruins of Tal Kuriabi, opposite the northwest corner of the lake of Hule, the situation of which would suit Hazer quite well, as it placed it between Ramah and Kadesh. On the other hand, the present ruins of Huzair or Hazira where there are remains of large buildings of very remote antiquity with which Noble, Professor Noble identifies Hazer, cannot be thought of for a moment as these ruins, which are about an hour and a quarter to the southwest of Yathir, are so close to Ramah or Asher that Hazer must also have belonged to Asher but it didn't, it belonged to the tribe of Naphtali. There would be more reason for thinking of Tel Hazor or Kerbet Hazor, like these geographical details of this German professor, on the southwest of Svazed, but these ruins are not very ancient and only belong to an ordinary village. Maiden is only mentioned again in chapter 1219, and its situation is quite uncertain. Shimron, called Shimron Meron in chapter 1220, was allotted to the tribe of Zebulun, and it also is unknown. For Meron cannot be connected, this Professor Noble supposes, with the village and ruins of Maroon, not far from Kadesh or Shimron with the ruins of Kurabia, an hour to the south of Kadesh as the territory of Zebulun to which Shimron belonged. Not so far as the north, and there's not the slightest ground for assuming that there were two Shimrons. We're making a distinction between the royal seat mentioned here and Shimron of Zebulun. There's also no probability in Professor Noble's conjecture that the Shimron named last is the same village as Simunic on the west of Nazareth. That's way down south. Ashkaf, the border of Asher, is also unknown. And therefore, to have been formed the boundary of Asher. Now, nor is it to be identified with Akko, Talmes, as Noble imagined, since Akko has nothing in common with Ashkef except the letter Kopf. So we'll take that up in the morning. I'm sure that has devotional potency with you, geographical details. We now turn our attention to Isaiah 2 6 through 9. 2, 1 to 5 was like a photograph of the Messiah's after the incarnation and of the influx of Gentiles by the gospel as we read in Acts 2 with the gift of tongues. The God of a thousand million languages who knows all those languages with infinite ease descends upon the believers and gives them miraculously foreign languages, not gibberish, languages, with known words, known syntax, known dictionary-level words, sentences that make sense, sentences that have content, as you can read in Acts 2, that the promise to Abraham of the gospel to the nations was now being ratified and a stamp of approval by the triune God in Acts 2. So a photograph is given in 2, 5, uh, Isaiah 2, 1 to 5, and now we are in 2, 6 through 9. 
and Henry is still dating this 758, which is before Ahaz and in the reign of Uzziah. Verse 6, and reading, Therefore thou hast forsaken thy people, the house of Jacob, because they replenished from the east and are soothsayers like the Philistines. And they please themselves and the children of strangers. Their land. So it's gone from that great picture we just talked, and he's coming back now to focus on Jerusalem. He's already blasted them in chapter one. I mean, some <laughs> get a helmet, a flak jacket. It sounds like he's going back to that. Their land is full of silver and gold, neither is there any end of their treasures. Their land is also full of horses, neither is there any end of their chariots. Their land also is full of idols. They worship the work of their own hands, that which their own fingers have made. And the mean man boweth down, and the great man humbleth himself, therefore forgive them not. The calling in of the Gentiles was accomplished and accompanied with the rejection of the Jews. It was their fall and the diminishing of them. That was the riches of the Gentiles. The casting off of them was the reconciling of the world. It should seem that these verses have reference to that and are designed to justify God therein. And yet it is probable that they are primarily intended for the convincing and awakening of the men of that generation in which the prophet lived. It being usual with prophets to speak of the things that then were both in mercy and judgment as types of the things that should be thereafter. We'll continue that tomorrow morning. Now we turn our attention to back to uh, the birth of Jesus in 118 through 25. We wondered this morning what kind of conversations did Mary and Joseph have? She went off to Elizabeth's house, her cousins, for three months and comes back. Both, she's had the divine annunciation by the angel to her, Mary, but then Joseph has an annunciation, and pretty soon they're off to Egypt. Do not fear to take unto thee, Mary, thy wife. Though a dark cloud now overhangs this relationship, it is unsullied. For that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost, and she shall bring forth a son. Observe that it is not said she shall bring forth thee a son, as was said to Zacharias of his wife Elizabeth. And thou shalt call his name Jesus. From the Hebrew, Yesh Yehoshua, Numbers 13, 16, or after the captivity it was contracted to Yeshua. Nehemiah 7.7, 7, meaning Jehovah, the Savior. In Greek, Jesus, to the awakened and anxious sinner, sweetest and most fragrant of all the names, expressing so melodiously and briefly his whole saving office and work. For he shall save his people, altos gar sosas. And I would call attention to the point of the reflexive pronoun. It does not get translated. And it means for he himself, he and no other, shall save. The he is here emphatic. He it is that shall save. He himself. He personally and by personal acts. His people the lost sheep of the house of Israel in the first instance, for they were the only people he had them. 
but on the breaking down of the middle wall of partition, the saved people embraced the redeemed unto God by his blood out of every kindred and people and tongue and nation from their sins in the most comprehensive sense of salvation from sin. Revelation 1, 5. Verse 22, now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin, it should be the virgin, uh, Parthenos, exactly as in the Hebrew, meaning a particular virgin destined to this unparalleled distinction. We will return to Professor Jameson in the morning. And now we come back to Revelation, our joyful book. Jesus in chapter 5 is emphatically, decisively on the throne. He has a book that only he can hold. And he is unleashing and breaking the seven seals that we find, or six seals that we find in chapter 6. And it's rather dark. There's a white horse that goes out and a black horse that brings war and then a red horse and horsemen and it's bloodshed and then uh, like I said this black horse in the third seal brings economic downturns and famine so we proceed on now to the fourth of these six seals in chapter six which John is commanded to observe there appears another horse and he is of pale color and the name of the rider on that horse is death the king of terrors and one might think of paleness when someone is dying with congestive heart failure their fingernails go blue because they're deoxygenated death the king of terrors the pestilence which is death in its empire, death reigning over a nation, death on a horseback, marching around, making fresh conquests every hour in every city of every nation, every day and every month. The attendants or followers of this king of terrors is called hell a state of eternal misery for all those who die in their sins. And in times of such general destruction, multitudes in combat and war go unprepared into the valley of destruction. It's an awful and scary thought, and enough, if considered, to make the whole world tremble if they had brains for it. That eternal damnation immediately follows upon the death of an impenitent sinner. Observe with this fourth seal of the pale horse and death as the rider that there is a natural as well as judicial connection between one judgment and another. War is a wasting calamity and draws scarcity and famine in its wake. Witness Germany in World War II, cities with orphans wandering around. Famine not allowing them proper sustenance and forcing them to take that which is unwholesome, which itself can bring pestilence after it. God's quiver is full of arrows. He never is at a loss for ways and means to punish a wicked individual or wicked nation, as we read in the prophets and in Jesus, Matthew 23 and 24. And now here, Jesus on the throne is the one unleashing these authorities and executing the decrees of God. In the book of God's counsels, that book that he holds, he has prepared judgments for scorners as well as, most thankfully, mercy and forgiveness for sinners who come humbly, penitently, brokenly. 
searching deep into the mud pond of their souls and openly confessing them before God and taking the presentation of Christ as their redeemer twofold. In the book of the scriptures, God has published threatenings against the wicked as well as promises of blessings for the righteous. And it is our duty to believe both the threatenings as well as the promises. So there on the fourth seal and tomorrow, I take it we'll go to the fifth seal. Let's respond with the Magnificat of Mary while she's with Elizabeth and away from Joseph. The announcement has been made to her that she'll have a child called the Son of the Highest. Luke 135, my soul doth magnify the Lord and my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior. He hath regarded the lowliness of his handmaiden. For behold, from henceforth all generations shall call me blessed. And he that is mighty hath magnified me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is on them that fear him throughout all generations. He hath showed strength with his arm. He hath scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He hath put down the mighty from their seat and hath exalted the humble and meek. He hath filled the hungry with good things and the rich he hath sent empty away. He remembering his mercy hath hope in his servant Israel as he promised to our forefathers Abraham and his seed forever. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Well, we come again to Professor Raymond. Hopefully the pace picks up because he's dealing with the tete-a-tete -tete between Dr. Van Til and Dr. Clark on what may be an arcane subject, except theologians, but let's see what happens. It has to do with what we know about God. These verses above, he's already quoted them from this morning, teach that man's knowledge of God can only be at best analogical in the Vantillian sense. On the contrary, some of them expressly declare that independence Upon God's propositional self-revelation in Scripture, human beings can know some of God's thoughts truly, that is, univocally. That is, that they can know a revealed proposition in the same sense that God knows it and has revealed it. This is really arcane, I get it. None of this is intended to suggest that scriptures contains no figures of speech. Of course they do. For example, the Bible is filled with metaphors. The Lord is my rock and my fortress, Psalm 18. It has similes, Isaiah 130. You will be like an oak with fading leaves, like a garden without water. But metaphors and similes intend univocal meanings. Once the appropriate canons of grammatico-historical hermeneutics have been determined, the precise literal meaning of a metaphor, its meaning must be precisely the same for God as for man. I'm a little, you know, God's knowledge is God's knowledge. Yes, both know there's some coincidence with God's infinite knowledge, and he is kind of vacillating here too. Christians, some should be overwhelmed by the magnitude of this simple truth that they take so much for granted, that the eternal God has designed to share with us some of the truths that are on his mind. He condescends down to our lowliest state. To lift us up poor undeserving sinners by actually sharing with us 
a portion of his knowledge. Accordingly, since the scriptures require that saving faith be grounded in the solid truth, Romans 10, 13, and 14, the church must vigorously oppose any linguistic or revelational theory, i.e. Bart and Bart Boltman, however well-intended that should take from men and women the only knowledge of God that they have, is, which is from his word. Against the theory of human knowledge, which would deny it the possibility, it is virtually important that we come down on the side of Christian reason and work with a Christian theory of knowledge that insists upon the possibility of at least some identity between the content of God's knowledge and the content of man's mind. And I got a footnote. Some of Dr. Van Til's students have attempted to extricate their revered mentor from this serious difficulty in which he ensnared himself. John Frame, in his monograph, Van Til, the theologian, argues that Van Til means nothing more by his denial of identity of content between divine and human minds than that God's knowledge, unlike human knowledge, is original and self validating. It is true that Van Dill Till does teach this, and with such teaching I have no quarrel. But I have come to agree with Jim Halsey, who argues in his review article in Westminster Theological Journal, that Van Till intends, because of the ontological considerations, to deny qualitative identity of knowledge content in the divine and human minds that frame has missed in Van Til's point. Arcane, I get it. Not something you'll be talking about with your neighbor, but now we turn with Prof Burkoff. We're talking about external calling, uh, something that goes out. It's Trinitarian, it contains the gospel, it's spread far and wide without respect of what the response might be. It's external. It comes to the ears. That's sort of the marine version. Let's see what Burkhoff's got. In this representation, the terms general or universal calling are not used in the sense in which they are intended. When it is said that the gospel call is general or universal. Moreover, the representation, and by the way, I like to read all these thousands and thousands of words. I want the marine version. Give it to me straight and simple. <laughs> external, anyway, this is a long story there. External calling is general only in the sense that it comes to all men to whom the gospel is preached indiscriminately and without exception or exemption. It is not confused to any age or nation or class of men. It comes to the just and unjust, the elect and the reprobate. The following passages testify to the nature of this call, Isaiah 51, 55, 1. Ho, everyone that it thirsts, come ye to the waters. He that hath no money, come, buy eat yea come buy wine and milk without money and without price in connection with this passage one might conceivably say <clears throat> that only spiritually qualified sinners are called but this cannot be the case as is said in isaiah 45 22 look unto me all ye and be saved all ye ends of the earth, for I am God, and there is no one else. Some also interpret the familiar invitation of Jesus in Matthew eleven twenty eight. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, 
and I will give you rest. As limited to such as are truly concerned about their sins. But there is no warrant for such a limitation. The last book of the Bible concludes with a beautiful general invitation. And the spirit and the bride say, come. And he heareth, and he that heareth, let him say, come. And he that is a thirst, let him come. But that will, let him take of the water freely. Revelation twenty-two seventeen. That the gospel invitation is not limited to the elect, as some hold, is quite evident from a long string of passages I'll forego. The general character of this calling is also taught in the canons of Dort. That this doctrine repeatedly met with opposition by individuals and groups in reformed churches. In the Scottish church of the 17th century, some denied the indiscriminate invitation and offer of salvation, while others wanted to limit it to the confines of the visible church. Over against these marrow men, such as Boston and the Erskins, defended it. In the Netherlands, this point was disputed, especially in the 18th century. They who maintained the universal offer were called preachers of the new light, while they who defended the particular offer, which is where I'm probably at, the offer to those who already gave evidence of a measure of special grace and could therefore be reckoned as among the elect or known as preachers of the old light. Even in the, our present day, which for him would have been 1945-ish, the general invitation and offer, some say, is inconsistent with the doctrine of predestination and particular atonement, doctrines which it is thought the preacher should take his starting point. But the Bible does not teach that the preacher of the gospel should take his starting point in these doctrines unless it's St. Paul in Ephesians 1, who does, or 1 Thessalonians 1, as he does. But it, the starting point is the Great Commission. No argument there. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, and he that believeth not shall be condemned. We'll call that an end there with the Dutch professor. And now for apostolic Christianity, Prof. Schaff, 1 to 100, has, before he gets his start, is giving like a 30-page overview of church historians. It's very delightful, and he's now talking about the Protestant Reformation, the historians. The tone is therefore controversial throughout talking about this Lutheran, um, Matthias Flaccius, church historian. And it's as partial as that of the annals of the Roman historian, Baronius. The style is tasteless and repulsive, but the amount of persevering labor, immense though ill-digested and an unwieldy mass of material, and the boldness of the criticism. He was very anti-papal, this Lutheran, and very anti-Calvinist. The centuries, that's the title of his multi-volume work, broke the path of free historical study and are the first general history deserving of the name. They introduced a new method. They divided the material by centuries and each century by a uniform Procrustean scheme of not less than 16 rubrics, De loco et propagatione ecclesia. <coughs> well, I won't read the rest. De mutationibus politicus. The plan destroys all symmetry and occasions wearisome, different diffuseness and repetition. The Swiss 
Reformed historian J. J. Hottinger died 1667 in his Historia Ecclesiastica New Testamenti, published at Zurich, nine volumes, furnished a Reformed counterpart to the Magdeburg centuries. It is less original and vigorous, but more sober and modern. It comes down to the 16th century, to which alone five volumes are devoted. From Fred Sponheim of Holland, 1649, we have Summa Historiae Ecclesiastica, coming down to the 16th century, built on a thorough and critical knowledge of the sources and serves at the same time as a refutation of Baronius. So in due time, after he introduces those, he'll begin the apostolic period 100 and go through basically the New Testament. Now in the Middle Ages, 590 to 1073, we're still talking about the Irish church and how they were really a missionary evangelizing outfit for three to 400 years. The second order, likewise of four reigns till 599, was of Catholic presbyters. And by Catholic, they're not thinking Roman. Because they, one thing the Irish were not, these Celtic missionaries, they weren't under Roman control for three to four hundred years. But really quite independent. A story that never gets told. 300 in number with a few bishops. They had one Christ, one Easter, one haircut tonsure style. But they had different gatherings and rules, and they refused the services of women, separating them from their monast the monasteries. The third, there were like three, this is late. The third order of saints consisted of 100 holy presbyters and a few bishops living in desert places on herbs and water and alms of the faithful. The first period may be called Episcopal, though in rather non-Episcopal and undiocesan sense. Angus, in his litany, invokes 7 times 50, 350 cleric bishops. Bishop was used as a term for presbyter then. Not like we think Bishop Presbyter Deacon. 350 bishops meant 350 ministers, whom the Patriot Patrick ordained. 300 pure presbyters. In Nennius, the number of presbyters in, is increased to 3,000, and in the tripartite life of Patrick to 5,000. A lot of stuff. Historic accretions arose around Patrick and his life. These bishops, even if we greatly reduce the numbers we must, had no higher rank than the ancient Cori Episcopoi or country bishops in the Eastern Church, of whom there was once in Asia Minor alone upwards of 400 in, in the area of Turkey. Angus the Caldi gives us 153 groups seven bishops, each serving in the same church. Patrick, regarding himself as the chief bishop of the whole Irish people, planted a church wherever he made a few converts and could obtain a grant from the chief of the clan and placed a bishop ordained by himself over it. It was a congregational, tribal episcopacy united by a federal rather than territorial plan of jurisdiction. During Patrick's life, he no doubt exercised a superintendence over the whole, but we do not see any trace of metropolitan jurisdiction of the Church of Ar Armagh over the rest. Continue that story tomorrow on Patrick. And now we turn to the Swiss Reformation we finished the story of Grisson, Switzerland, and now we turn to Gallicus, the Reformation in Grisson itself. Some of the leaders, Commander Gallicus Campbell. 
the Christianization of the Grisons that's up down in the southeast corner is traced back to the tradition of St. Lucius, a royal prince of Britain, and Emerita, his sister, in the latter part of the second century. Again, the Christian faith was in England in the second century. Long before, so, you know, some of these guys come along and say, oh, Augusta the Canterbury in 594 introduced Christianity into England. It's a big, it's fake history. Fake history. Celts, Celtic Christians were there. Tertullian writes of it in 200 AD that they were up in England. They went to the Synod of Arles in 314, but three bishops. They attended the Synod of Nicaea in 325. Anyways, bad history. The chapel on the mountain above Cor perpetuates the memory. A bishop of Cor appears for the first time in the year 452, as signified by his proxy, the creed, for the creed of Chalcedon sent a proxy to Chalcedon 451 over in Asia Minor. The bishops of Kor acquired great possessions and became temporal princes as happened in the Middle Ages. There's reasons for that. The whole country of the Grison stood under the jurisdiction of the bishops of Kor and Como. The state of religion and the need of a reformation were the same there as in the other 12 or 13 cantons of Switzerland. The first impulse to reformation came from Zurich, with which the Corps had close connections. And we will resume that, God willing, tomorrow morning. Now we turn from learning about the faith to confessing our faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. <coughs> Confessing our faith again in the larger catechism. What is repentance unto life? Question 66, 76. Repentance unto life is a saving grace wrought inside the heart of a sinner by the Spirit and Word of God, whereby out of the sense and sight, not just of the danger, but also the very filthiness and odiousness of his sins, and upon the apprehension of God's mercy in Christ, to such as are penitent, humbled, grieve, and hate those sins, so that he turns from them all, purpose, purposing and endeavoring constantly to walk before him in all the inner ways of new obedience. So in reciting our faith, we're also learning about what others confess. And right now we're talking about the Greeks. And we saw that uh, Patriarch Jeremiah uh, views Lutherans and Calvinists as heretics. But now we come to another confession, and that's an official position. Metrophanes Critopoulos in 1625. In chronological order comes the confession of Metrophanes Christopoulos, once patriarch of Alexandria in Egypt written in 1625, though not published till 1661. Metrophanes Citropoulos was a native of Berea in Macedonia, northern Greece, 
and educated at Mount Athos on in Eastern Greece. That's still functioning as a monastery. Cyril Luker, then Patriarch of Alexandria, sent him to England, Germany, and Switzerland in 1616 with a recommendation to the Archbishop of Canterbury, George Abbott, a reformed and Calvinistic Archbishop of Canterbury, by the way, the last one, that he might, he sent this man, he might be thoroughly educated to counteract in behalf of the Greek church, the intrigues of the counter-reformation Jesuits. The Archbishop of Canterbury kindly result, received him and with the consent of James I, secured him a place in the colleges of Oxford. In 1620, Metrophanes visited the universities of Wittenberg, Tübingen, Aldorf, Strasbourg, and Hemstedt. He acquired good testimonials for his learning and character. He entered into close relations with Calixtus and a few like-minded Lutheran divines who dissented from the exclusive confessionalism and scholastic dogmatism of the 17th century and labored for Catholic union on the basis of the prim primitive creeds. At their request, Metrophanes prepared a work on the faith and worship of the Orthodox Church. He wrote a number of philosophical essays. After spending some time in Venice as a teacher of the Greek language, he returned to the East and became successor of Cyril Lucar in Alexandria. But he disappointed the hopes of his patron and as a member of the Synod of Constantinople, 1638, he even took part in his condemnation. Uh, Cyril Luker was a, a patriarch who became a Calvinist, tried to bring Calvinism to the Greek Orthodox Church. And that didn't go over well. And his name has been forever blasphemed in Greek circles. From learning to confessing, now we turn to prayer. The Lord be with you and with thy spirit, let us pray. O Lord, show thy mercy upon us and grant us thy salvation. Lord, save them that rule and mercifully hear us when we call upon thee. Do thy ministers with righteousness make thy chosen people joyful. O Lord, save thy people and bless thine inheritance, heritage. Give peace in our time, O Lord, because there is no one else who fights for us but thou and thou alone. O God, may clean our hearts within us. Take not thy Holy Spirit from us. O God, our refuge and our strength, our help in ages past who art the author of all godliness. Be ready, we beseech thee, to hear the devout prayers and petitions of thy church. Grant that those things which we ask faithfully, we may obtain effectually through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O God, from whom all holy desires, all good counsels, and all just works do proceed, Give unto thy servants that peace which the world cannot give, that both our hearts may be set to obey thy commandments, and also that by thee we, being defended from the fear of our enemies, may pass our time in rest and quietness. <clears throat> Through the merits of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Lighten our darkness, we beseech thee, O Lord, Shine your light inside our souls and minds. Lighten us by the light of Jesus himself. By thy great mercy also defend us from all perils and dangers of this night. For the love of thy only Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Almighty God, you've given us grace at this time with one accord 
to make our inquiries and supplications, our learnings and confessions, our desires made known unto thee. And you've promised that when two or three are gathered together in your name, you will be present and grant the requests. Fulfill now, O Lord, the desires and petitions of thy servants, as may be most expedient for them, granting us in this world knowledge of thy truth, and in the world to come, life everlasting. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Ghost be with us all evermore. Amen. Here ends the order for evening prayer daily throughout the year.